Hello, everybody, and welcome to my latest live stream on infrared photography. Uh, my name is Rob Shea. So glad to have you here with me today. Uh, I want to cover a lot of the images and material that I didn't get to in the last live stream. Still have a lot more really interesting images and questions to go through. So I'm excited to get to those today. First off, let's talk about how you can learn more about uh, uh, information about infrared photography. First off, it's by checking out my book. Uh, at infraredbook.com. If you'd like to learn more about this or future live streams, you could go to my website at 590.red slash live to learn more about uh, the live streams. And finally, uh, if you want to get any other information about infrared, my downloads or other materials, then be sure to check out the uh, my blog at 590.red slash blog. All righty. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, so glad you could join me here today. I've got um, some images queued up and I'd like to get us started with um, a really nice image that was sent in by uh, Christian. So we'll dive to that in a second. Welcome to everybody who's joining me live. Um, and if you're not able to join live, then uh, thanks for tuning into the recording. So let's see here. Um, just say hello to everybody. Make sure people can hear me okay. All right, so thanks for joining. Uh, if you're if you're live in the chat, let me know where you are joining from, uh, what state or what country. Um, so welcome. Uh, all right, so let's dive in and and look at an image. So the first image that I have, as I mentioned, is from Christian, and we'll look at uh, uh, the version he sent in, and then I'll do an edit and I'll show you some ideas that I have. Um, uh, hello, and and Shul and John. Thanks for joining us. Okay, let's see here. So we'll pull up this image and take a look here. All right. So this is the image uh, sent in from Christian, and I really, I mean, I really like this image. You've got uh, this amazing landscape. I mean, just forgetting the infrared for a second. You've got this amazing landscape um, with uh, this foreground uh, and then that beautiful hill in the background and then a splash of light here. Now, let me pull up my cursor here so you can see my cursor better here on the stream. There we go. So you've got this um, splash of, of light coming across the image. So this is an absolutely lovely composition. Um, so I, I love the um, I, I love the detail and the color. Uh, so let's let's take a look at uh, a raw version and and work through um, how we might process an image like this. So here is the uh, the raw version of the image. Let me get to uh, the develop module, hitting the D key here in Lightroom Classic. So the first thing that I'll do is pull up a, uh, a profile. We'll probably start, this looks like it's got a lot of, of uh, saturation, color saturation. So I'll probably go with negative 100, which is better for t in general, tends to be better for images that have a lot of color saturation. You'll notice that as I move my mouse around the image, that up in the upper left hand corner in the navigator, you'll get a preview of what the white balance is going to look like. So if I roll over the building, if I was to roll over the clouds, you can see uh, slight different variations on what the final image will look like when you click. So I'm going to click the clouds here, and I think that'll give me a nice look. Um, and then I can swap the colors. You, you could you could keep these colors if you like, or you could swap the colors. So we can go down to our, I'm going to open up the profile browser here. We'll select the, open that up and go to my color swap profiles, and I'll pick one of these colors. And you can look at various color treatments and kind of see how they look, what, what kind of uh, view you'd like to get. So let's pick one of these. I'll pick the the red blue channel swap and then we can get started. I'd like to do something a little bit different with this image, something that I haven't done before. So um, we're going to try something new here. Hopefully it'll work. Uh, it, you can see it'll work because if you look over here, I tried it a bunch of times already. <laughs> so um, let us take the color saturation and reduce it all the way because this is this is a lovely composition, but the challenge with an image like this is that there is so much color 
uh, with, with the full saturation of the image. Just so much color that it can be a wash of color. And sometimes with some compositions in infrared, this can be a challenge because the color tends to look very uniform and you don't have as much color variation in the foliage. And so uh, it can be a challenge. So this is, this is gonna, we're gonna address a little bit of that in this image, one, one way to address it. And I'm gonna start by getting rid of all the color because we're gonna look at this image from a black and white perspective. So let me create, I'm gonna go up to the mask panel and we're gonna start building some masks. So the first one I'll build is a sky. Some of this will look very similar because what I'm trying to do is build uh, contrast in different parts of the image. Um, and so I can go into the sky. I can accept that as is, or uh, you might notice there's a little bit of, uh, of color that's sort of bleeding into some of the edges here. Um, and so what I can do is I can right click on the sky mask and select uh, or, 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 or just double click to open up this, this panel down here and I can subtract a brush. And now when I subtract a brush, I can pull out some of those parts of the image that I don't want to be affected by my sky mask. And I'll hold down my space bar to move around. And I'm not gonna get too precise here, but I'm gonna do a little bit of cleanup here of the edges just to get me a little bit better. Sometimes it'll really, really carry over. Sometimes it can be subtle. Okay, so that's good. So that's my sky. So let's add a little bit of contrast. So you, you probably know that I like to add dehaze to the sky. So we'll add a little bit of dehaze. I'm not gonna, you could go crazy in an image like this, but I'm not gonna add too much. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna keep it less crazy. Now, uh, the other thing that I really like to do is use the tone curve, especially now that it's in masks. But you'll notice um, when I've, if you, you'll notice the difference between the curve here and this background, which is very highly uh, uh, leaning towards the right of the image compared to the histogram up top, which is covering the entirety of the image. This part of the image uh, down here is just showing what's affected by the mask. And we're gonna use that to help increase the contrast in the image. So if we go down to our presets, and I'm gonna hit strong preset, not because I'm gonna use it because it throws a couple dots on the screen for me that I can, that I can get to quickly. I'm gonna grab some of these dots and start moving them around. And I'm gonna move them in relation to this peak. What I wanna do is I want contrast to appear here because like in this case, you can see the, these dots down here aren't doing much because there's not a lot of pixels that are, that are at that point the, of the tonal range of the image. Most of the pixels are up here in this level of brightness. So I wanna move these dots over so that I can affect this part of the image. And as I move over here, I wanna create a sharp, a sharper steep of the curve here at a point where it's crossing over this range of tones. That's what's going to create contrast. Adjusting these ones over here is not gonna do a whole lot. Um, I could probably even get rid of these, but I'm really focused on this part of the image. So that get, gets some contrast in the sky. All right, so I've got my sky. Um, let me just quick rename this mask to sky. And then I wanna work on the rest of the image. So let's do right click and select duplicate and invert. And that'll get me everything except the sky. And, but I don't want this house. I want that to be handled separately. So let me zoom in and I use my space bar again to drag down. And I want to eliminate this house from the mask. So what I'll do is I'll go to my sky inverted and I'm just going to, I'm going to rename that background just for clarity. Uh, it's the, it's, or it's the landscape really. Uh, it's specifically, ironically, the landscape. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to subtract in this case, an object. I'm going to let Lightroom figure out what the, where the edges of this are, because it's probably got some nice clean edges. And then Lightroom can tell me where the edges are and then I, it saves me time from having to do the brushwork. All right, so uh, Lightroom did a really good job of outlining that house. And now if I zoom back out, you can see I have the landscape selected except for the sky and except for the house. Now I wanna come over here to uh, the controls that I have and kind of do the same thing. We'll do a little bit of 
of uh, texture and a little bit of clarity to bring a little bit of contrast. But a lot of the contrast I want to come from the curve. So we'll start again with a strong contrast. And again, I want to focus on this uh, peak uh, in, the, in the histogram within the curve itself. So I'll start taking these, this one to the right, and I want it to be a little high. And I'm going to take this one that's on the left side of the curve. I'm going to bring that down so that we're getting a lot of contrast sweeping through this peak. I can grab these and tweak them a bit. And then I'm going to take the ones at the lower end, and I'm going to bring those way down. And what, what I'm doing here, you know, in addition to, in addition to working on contrast is by, by doing this without the color saturation, it really allows me to focus on the tonal range of the image and uh, not so much be um, focused on the colors. We'll get back to the colors. We can address the colors. But first of all, I want to bring this, uh, I want to create a lot of contrast in the image. So uh, doing that and doing that with this um, uh, curve allows me to see exactly what I'm doing and have that kind of impact. So I can get a lot of contrast. I can play around and really see the impact on, the, on the, the, the actual contrast within the image. All right, that looks pretty good. So let's do one more uh, mask, and this one will be just for the house. So I will do select object, create a new mask object, and then we'll come down to the house, and I will again just highlight the house, and we'll treat that as a separate element that we want to uh, add contrast to. Now, let me zoom in again so I can see the house. And we're going to do the same thing. Now, this one's a little bit interesting because you'll notice here that there's really two or three peaks of areas where the, um, wh where the contrast is happening. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go after both of them by creating uh, steep slopes near each of these peaks so that I can have some contrast both in the highlights and in the shadows. There's a lot of interesting detail here. You've got detail in the side of the building, you've got detail in the roof, and we want to bring some of that out. So let me take these first two points on my curve here, and I want to bring them over and sort of wrap them around this peak, but I want to have one be higher than normal and one the one on the right is higher and the one on the left is lower. So that we're getting a sharp sort of steep curve here. And you can see that's how, how that's starting to add some, some contrast. And then I'll grab these other two points and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put them on either side of this other peak. And that'll allow me to get a lot of really nice contrast within this house. And I'm, I'm, attacking the tones that are specifically in the house by using the mask. That's one of the really nice things about the mask. Now, the, this curve looks very different than a lot of, than your, your typical strong contrast, medium contrast, but you are going to have a lot more control. Now, you still want it to be generally um, somewhat of a smooth-ish curve, and you still, you don't want the, un, unless you're going for, it's going to be a rare image where you can actually have a, a dot on the left side be actually higher than a dot on the right side, that kind of inversion would look really unnatural. So you're still going to want to have this sloping from right down to left, but you can have some bumps in that. As you can see here, I can adjust these and, and play around to get the kind of level of contrast that I want to see in each of these points and really affect how the this house is going to look. All right, so that gives you an idea of what that looks like. So that's a, a very unusual curve here, but I like the way that it looks on screen. Okay, so now we've added a lot of contrast to the image, and there's the, 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 there's a lot more sort of punch going on in the image. Let's bring the color back in and talk about what's going to happen with the color. So if I come back to my basic panel, close the mask, come back to the basic panel, I'll take the saturation, and I'll start to bring it up. I'm going to bring it up really slowly. Notice that if I've only brought it up, uh, in this case, to like negative 73, negative 75, there's still the, the amount of con you're still getting nice color. Um, but the it's, it's allowing the, the, the contrast and the underlying image to really dominate. Um, and I could bring it up higher and I could, if I, if I bring it all the way up to zero, 
you're going to see then the color just becomes kind of almost severe. And to the point where if I had the color on, I would have never put this amount of contrast in. And so by having the color out kind of allowed me to do that. And now I can sort of back off the color if I want to. And there's a couple ways that I can do that. So the obvious one is I could pull down saturation, but let me show you, and I'm probably going to do that, but let me show you another way as well. So if I go back into the masks, let's look at the house specifically, because I think that that's a really good example. You can start to see, you can see color, might be hard to see in the stream, but, but I'm seeing a little bit of color, almost looks like chromatic aberration around the edges. And maybe I want to get rid of that. I want the house to be this sort of black and white punch that kind of punches through this landscape. So what I can do is if I go to this mask, this was the, this was the house mask and I select this and here's that crazy curve that I had. There's a new feature that exists in uh, Lightroom classic and Lightroom and Adobe camera raw and any place you use, you use these masks called refined saturation. And I can take this and I can reduce the amount of saturation that's being affected by the curve. So the curve then gets applied to only the, the tones, but not the color, not the color. So if I bring that down, so if I, I find that you, you could remove it entirely to try to just bring all of that color artifacts out, or you could find some middle ground. Now for this image, I think I'm just going to remove it entirely. That'll get rid of all of the color tones that exist here, but I could actually go through each one of these masks. If I look at the background and I could pull down the refined saturation and that would have, I mean, there's a lot of saturation here, but, uh, you know, that maybe somewhere around the middle here, somewhere around 50, you know, that gives me, it still has that color coming through, but it's got a lot more of the, uh, of the contrast. So play around with this. Um, I could do the same with the sky. Of course you could, you could just now in the sky, we've got a lot of color coming in, uh, that I don't know if is real. Cause those might just be clouds in the background. We might be seeing some sort of artificial infrared artifacts. This seems to be a little slow in updating. If I was to drag it down to zero. So you can play with this refined saturation. The, the thing I like about this is that it allows me to really kick up the contrast on a, an infrared image that needs contrast without necessarily making the colors too severe. So I could do this. If I come back to the basic panel, then I could still make additional adjustments. I could, I could reduce the saturation further if I wanted to, and kind of get to a, a sweet spot. And for, for an image like this, I might play around some more. I might darken up the mountain a little bit and, and, and do a little more work to play around with where I want the light to come through. So having the light hit this house, I might even, you know, for example, you might take the house and increase its exposure slightly so that it stands out a little bit more in the image. Uh, you could use a brush to highlight some of these fields and punch those up or, uh, darken up the mountain so that this color in the foreground stands out. There's a lot of things that you could do like that, but, uh, using the, the contrast that's available, I think would, especially in images that are a wash of foliage like this can really have a nice impact. So, um, thank you, Christian. Let's take a look at the, uh, the bef before and after version of this. So while this is not before and after, this is, this is, uh, the version that I had on the left. Uh, and this is Christian's JPEG edit on the right. Um, I think this is an amazing, uh, composition, um, and, uh, has so much potential uh, to work with. So thank you so much for, for sending this image in. I really appreciate it. Very nice work. All righty here. Oops. Okay. So let me, uh, see what's happening here. Thanks to everybody who's joined. Uh, Nastavnik, Phil, Harold, Ann, Bill, Martin. Thank you all for joining. Some of you, I have some questions and images coming up, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, let me get to the next one here. Uh, let's see. And of course, if you have any questions you want to throw in the chat, go ahead and throw those in the chat. We'll cover those as well. I have the next image I have is from Rowan. So let me cue that up. Let's see here. Maybe I'll get myself a drink, coffee. 
try to keep myself alert tonight. All right. Let's see here. All right. This is an image uh, that Rowan shared. This is a JPEG, so let me pull this up, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, excuse me one second. So this is what Rowan said. He said, hi, Rob, sorry, I won't be able to attend your live stream. Well, this was for probably for the, for the one last Saturday um, because it would have been 4 a.m. in New Zealand. But thank you for uh, your interest from all the way from New Zealand. But I've decided to send you an image for your critique anyway. One of the issues I have with my IR images is noise. This image is a good example of that, especially in the sky. I've tried uh, luminance noise reduction to 100%. It helps, but it doesn't overcome it completely any suggestions. So let's take a look at this. So at this sort of magnification, let me see here. This is, um, this is, uh, let's see at a hundred percent. Yeah. So a little bit of magnification here. So let's, uh, take a look. So, I mean, the, the image is very nice. Let's look at some of the details here, uh, that, that could be having an impact. So if I pull up, if I look at your, uh, your metadata here uh, over on the right, I can see that you have an ISO of 100. That's good. Uh, uh, low ISO, of course, is going to mean low noise. And in most infrared, if you're shooting a landscape outdoors, you should have plenty of light and no reason to go above that. So ISO 100 is very good. Um, F16, I don't know which camera this is. Let me see here. This is a Sony... Um, uh, a seven Mark II. Um, I'm pretty sure that that is a full frame camera. Uh, so I would say that you really might want to stay away from F 16. Um, you could intentionally shoot that. Uh, what, what will happen is that, uh, we're sort of as, as landscape photographers, we get conditioned to try to shoot the, uh, the, the highest numbered F stop that we can to get the most depth of field. And the challenge with infrared is that's going to introduce diffraction faster than it will in visible light. And in fact, uh, with a full frame camera, you could see diffraction at F11, uh, where you might not see it in at F11 or F16 in visible light. So that one of the things that I would do would be to reduce that F stop and get that down to about an F8, uh, for full frame, uh, maybe lower depending on the filter you're using. If I'm using a an infrared only filter like uh, something above 750 say an 8 830 850 i would probably go two stops lower than than i would in visible light so i might do even an f point f 5.6 on a full frame camera so that's one thing to keep in mind and that'll get you a little bit more shutter speed uh, although that's probably not the issue let's let's uh, so that's the one thing i would do is is work on your f your f stop let's uh zoom in and look at the image here and see if we can identify uh, what else is going on? So if I zoom in, I'm going to have to, let me zoom into like more than I would normally sort of 200% because I want you to be able to see some of these details on the screen. And you can kind of see um, what I would probably call worming here happening in the sky. Um, and so this could be uh, probably what this is resulting from is a sharpness level that is too high. Now we're looking at your JPEG, so I don't have your raw here, so I can't confirm this, but if we go over to the develop module, what I can do is go down to uh, the the uh, detail panel, and this this could be similar. In a, you know, it doesn't need to be Lightroom. A variety of editors will have something similar uh, to a sharpening. And normally, the sharpening default for Lightroom, depending on your camera, is usually like 20, 25, 40, something like that. If you turn the sharpness all the way up, and you you'll really be able to see it here. Hopefully, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see it on this on the stream here. You can see this um, artifacting uh, that is really coming into the clouds, this worming that's happening, and this is the result of this high degree of sharpening. So I so there's there's a couple ways to address this. One is to use less sharpening um, to really to really get that down. The other is if you if you if you this may be the same in other programs, but if you're using Lightroom, let me just zoom out to the full image. You can use masking, and if you increase the masking, it will limit where 
the sharpening is taking effect. And the more masking you have, the more prone that the masking is going to be to take place only at sharp edges. So the edges of this barn, the tree, the fence, uh, the, the light post in the background, and less on the clouds. So if I have an image that I want to sharpen, I will use, I will almost always use masking because I don't want that sharpness to apply to the clouds and some of the other details that I like. So keep an eye on your masking. Um, and I think that that would, uh, help to address some of the, some of the worming or the artifacts that you're seeing. Um, you, and, and then, so a little bit of, uh, uh, controlling your, your sharpening, not too high. If you do sharpen, use masking, use a little bit of noise reduction, and you really should see most of those problems go away. Um, I would say that uh, you, things should look pretty good at this point. And, and most of the rest of the image looks pretty good to me. It's just, it's just that kind of, it's mostly in the clouds where I'm seeing it most dramatically. Um, and it definitely looks like over sharpening. So just keep an eye on that. Um, and, and you can get uh, some good improvements there. But I like, I like the image you've shared. Uh, nice composition. Um, and I love the, the, the style, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh old things, <laughs> old barns, old buildings always tend to look good in, uh, in infrared to me. So thank you for sharing that image. All right. So let's see, uh, Phil had a question. Could you talk about what filter or modification may have been used in the photos? So, um, in this case, uh, let's see, uh, Rowan didn't share uh, what was used in this image. And in fact, the last one that Christian, uh, shared, he did, he did not share either. Um, but let me guess. So in this one, uh, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would expect, uh, whiter, uh, leaves on the trees. Um, so it's, it's unclear that, that might mean to me that this was a, uh, maybe a, a, a lower numbered cutoff, like a 590. Um, that was then converted to monochrome, which is perfectly viable, but it's really hard to say with this one. I don't really know. The first image that Christian shared, the one that was more colorful was probably a 590 or something near that. There was definitely lots of color saturation. I suppose it could have even been a 550, uh, because it did have a lot of color in it. Uh, so somewhere between a 550 and a 590 is what that would be. Uh, and, and my, my general rule of thumb is especially between about a 550 or a five, even 515, and 720 ish, it's really about color saturation. So the more color saturation you see, the more, the more, the lower that number is, the more likely it is to be a 515 or a, a 550, AKA the orange filter. Uh, if you see a moderate amount of saturation, it tends to be a 590. And if you see very light saturation, it tends to be a 720. Now, of course that is without editing, you can, uh, alter that dramatically. You could add a ton of saturation to a 720 image, or you could reduce the saturation on a 550 image either way. Uh, but without editing, that tends to be the general. All righty here. Uh, next up, uh, let's see. Next up is Martin. Uh, but a different, a different Martin. Sorry, Martin. <laughs> um, and so let's see, let me pull up the images that Martin shared uh, here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So we've got a few images. Um, and let me, let me pull one of these up and then we'll see what I'll read what Martin had to say. So here's the first one. Hi, Rob. I've submitted three images, all raw. One is of the churchyard of our village where I live, and the other two are down by the seaside. I haven't had a chance yet to crack at editing them. I'm hoping to get some inspiration if you work your magic on them. Best wishes, Martin. All right, so let's take a look at these. So these, let me, let's start. We'll do a quick edit here. And I should be able to, he didn't say what the filters were for these, but I'll see if I could take a guess. We'll start with infrared temp negative 100. Now, for an image like this, I'm going to guess that this is a 720 nanometer filter. If I white balance on the clouds, I'm getting a very soft blue in the foliage. Uh, and so that would, that's what leads me to believe that this is a 720. And of course the, the yellow gold tones in the sky are very subtle as well. 
Uh, the other thing that you could do with a 720 is you could also white balance on the trees. That is will tend to make them more white uh, and push the the clouds to be a little bit more yellow, which doesn't look great here, but if you did a color swap, they would be blue. Let me let me show you what that looks like. Let's do a color swap and see what the differences look like. That's one of the nice things about being able to swap the colors here. Let me pick this um, split, which would give a very realistic, this is the red blue swap and splitting the green channels, which has a very, which for, for, for me has a tendency to create very naturalistic uh, blue skies. So if I pick that, and then if I white balance on the clouds, then you'll see that there's a little less color saturation in the clouds, and I get a little bit of a, of a uh, kind of a yellowish tone here in the trees. And if I white balance in the trees, it pushes the clouds to a little more bluish and whitens the, the trees out. So if you were looking for... Um, if you're looking to have white leaves, uh, in your, in your infrared image, then, then white balancing on the leaves in a 720 nano image, 720 nanometer image could be a good way to go. It's harder to do that with lower numbered cutoffs because you're going to have too much color, but with a 720, you could kind of pull it off. So, um, some people like that look, uh, I don't so much. That's not my choice. I prefer to like white balance on the clouds and, and then get the color contrast between the two. Um, so for an image like this, this is tricky because, you know, if you've seen a, a lot of my work in this year, you know that I usually start with the sky and the sky is going to be really tricky in an image like this because if I do a mask then and a select sky, it's going to be hard to uh, to pull up and isolate the, uh, the sky, especially in all of these areas between the trees. Lightroom, yeah, as you can see, struggles a little bit. You could go through and do a mask and kind of paint in all of the areas that that the the that the sky mask missed, uh, but that's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, so I don't know if I would I would spend the time to do that. But while I'm here, let me just throw a little extra dehaze on here to uh, punch up the clouds. The the more interesting clouds are over here anyway, so I can punch those up a little bit, and then. The other thing that I, the other challenge then is if I can't do a sky, I, it's harder to do, to inverse the sky. Um, and so the other thing that you could do instead would be to do a mask with a color range. And if I did a color range and then just drew here in the middle of the screen here in this, uh, brush, then that would pick up that color in infrared. It's going to pick up a lot of the image. And so, cause Lightroom's not really tuned for that and I could, but I can use the refine to kind of edge that back and try to limit what, what's happening here. So you're, you're in a, in a situation like this, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to isolate the trees from the sky. Um, and so that's, that's, that, that could be tricky. You might, you might in an image like this say, well, I just, I can't do it. And I do all of my changes globally. And that's certainly fine. The other thing, if, while I'm here though, uh, what, what could I do? I could increase the contrast of these. I could play with the saturation if I liked. We'll do some strong contrast. We'll do a little texture and clarity. You could also do negative clarity if you wanted a bit of a glow. That might be kind of interesting in an image like this, add a little bit of a glow. Uh, the other thing that I like to do in images like this is I will uh, isolate the path and try to create some strong contrast with the path. So I'm just going to do a very quick version of that here, highlighting the path. And then I would, you know, spend more time getting this good and getting the edges good. But then if you were to say, bring the blacks down uh, dramatically, you could create a stronger look there. I really like the contrast that exists between um, the, uh, the, the neutral elements of the image, like a path and the rest of the image. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I would do in an image like this. Okay, let's move on to the next image uh, that Martin submitted. Um, this next one, similar, uh, before even editing, you know, I, I, I actually kind of like the really strong color. Occasionally, you know, we, we talk a lot about taking the, uh, using a special profile to get a, a, a good white balance um, and 
get get blue skies and colorful foliage and all this kind of stuff. But you know, sometimes maybe a really dramatic sky like this uh, could be really interesting. Maybe maybe you want to use this kind of the way it is. I might you know kick up the kick up a little bit of uh, of exposure here. The other thing that I might do in an image like this. I've done this in a few images that I really enjoy. If you've got a good close up of a tree, you might go in and do a, uh, you know what? I'm gonna get crazy here and try the select object. I'm gonna see what select object. I wanna select this tree, but I wanna save time and not try to brush it. So I'm gonna go ahead and see how Lightroom does. It might get funky near the top. We'll see. We'll see how it does for selecting this tree. Well, it's. That's not bad. That's better than I thought it was. So let me do an add brush. One of the nice things about adding these things together is you can you can let Lightroom take a first pass on something, and then you can come back and take another pass and add to it. So that's not that's a pretty good mask. So with the tree isolated, if you've got a nice tree with a lot of really good bark, I like to to really focus on that, and I might get a little nutty with the texture and the clarity to really bring out the details in that. I might even bring up the exposure of the tree a little bit so it stands out, so it pops a little bit. So look for those kind of opportunities. Even when you're out shooting, think about what you want the subject to be of your image and look for opportunities to to create, to enhance those. And so enhancing uh, or drawing attention to something like uh, tree bark uh, could be really interesting. And of course, you've got the road here as well. So figure out what you want to draw attention to. So again, this is an example of a, of a case where this sky color is pretty interesting to me and I might leave it as is. Or you could edit it and do the, the kind of color swap. So, uh, so your, your choice. Uh, one more image uh, that Martin sent in. Uh, let's take a look here. So it looks like, let me, let me do a quick white balance on this one. I'll try the church here. It's a little overexposed. Let me do a quick auto to try to get it back in balance. So we've got a nice, nice composition here. Um, some, I, 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 I might include a little more of the road to try to see this kind of sweep, these sweeping lines at the bottom. It looks like this might be a little bit out of focus. Um, so if I zoom in here, I could see it's a little bit soft. If I look up at the, the metadata, there's no metadata uh, for the lens. So what that tells me is that I'm going to guess you were using a vintage lens here um, and maybe, uh, maybe missed focus slightly. Uh, could be due to the lens. It could be a manual focus lens. One of the, I really like shooting uh, vintage lenses, but of course you do have to focus manually and that can be more challenging. One of the th things that I like to do, there's a couple of the focus assist tools that I think work really well. The, the, it's called different things on different cameras. There's one that zooms in and allows you to kind of punch in and focus. That one's useful. Uh, focus peaking, I really like, um, especially if I can change the color of the focus peaking, I like to make it blue because then it'll stand out against the red image. So focus peaking, especially I've had some cameras with really, that were really challenging to focus, especially vintage uh, lenses, vintage lenses that were really challenging to focus with. Um, and the focus peaking can be critical to being able to see that. I don't trust my eye. I have, I don't know about y'all, but my eyes are garbage, <laughs> which is kind of ironic as a photographer, but like, if I didn't have my glasses, I would be lost. And so looking at a viewfinder, I don't trust when, even when I'm out in the field, I just do not always trust my eye to be able to nail focus. And so using those focus tools, uh, can be really valuable, uh, to, to really help, you know, nail an image like this. But again, uh, in this case, this looks like an image where I would probably do a more traditional color swap, um, and pick out an interesting collection of colors here that I was that I thought suited the image really well. You could get a little crazy, or you could go more traditional. Uh, either way, either the way that works for you. With an image like this, this to me, this has some of the classic elements that I consider for an infrared image. So you've got sky, which you can make really interesting by increasing 
uh, the dehaze of the sky. So that's that's one thing you could do. We'll go sky, uh, make those clouds really pop um, using dehaze. So that's the first thing. That's the first of the three elements that exists in a in to me in a sort of a classic uh, infrared image is the sky. The second is the foliage. So this colorful foliage, um, and you've got plenty of that here. And then the third is what I call the neutrals. Uh, but it's when I say neutrals, I mean color. So it's the elements that don't have color. So it's the road, it's the building, it's the, the headstones and the, I really like the contrast between the, the, the subject contrast, if you will, between those three elements, between the sky, the trees, and the neutral elements. I think those can classically, you, you find, you find those three things, you find a good composition and you can find, you can make a great infrared photo. So Martin, thank you for sharing uh, these images. You've got lots of possibilities for how you might edit them. Um, uh, keep an eye on, uh, you know, maybe working at work on the, uh, the manual focus it definitely can be tricky. All righty here, let's see. Uh, welcome uh, Spectra, glad you could join us. Uh, I think I've got, I've got your image coming up a little bit later. All righty, so let me move on. I've got a, an image from Steve, so let me pull that up. Um, all right, so let's see. I've got a couple JPEGs and I've got a raw image. So let me share that. So Steve says, hi, Rob. Sent three files through for your perusal. Just starting out with IR Chrome, so would welcome your thoughts on my edit, Steve. So you can see this is the JPEG. So this is the, the edited version um, of the image. Um, and then we've got, we've got an, another JPEG that is a, a slight twist on it. So another edit, uh, and then we have the raw file. So couple, couple thoughts when you're, when you're shooting, let's talk about like technical considerations first. Let me, let me just pull up, let me pull up all of these images here so we can look at them all. So, um, and, and, I'm basically in Lightroom Classic, what I did there is I selected all the images and then I hit the N key, which is for survey. I don't, I don't know why, why that short, why that's the shortcut key. Don't ask me that. Um, but the N key will show you a series of images that will fill your screen. Um, and so what we've got here is the left image is the raw, the center image is a JPEG edit, and then the, the right image is a JPEG edit. So, uh, something to keep in mind when you're shooting IR Chrome is you really, you may not need to do a lot. I've got a, um, I'm probably going to do another video on IR Chrome because I did a, I had a vacation a few months ago. I'm trying to remember when it was a few months ago where I shot a lot of, of, of IR Chrome and I want to put those together and then uh, talk about it some more, but I'll, I'll give you the short version now, which is you don't really need a special profile for it. You, you can use a special profile that would, would technically get you more, a better white balance, a, a better, better white balance. Um, but you really don't need it. You can, you can use a standard color profile. And so the, either of these sort of options that you've got here on the right, uh, the, the, the middle or the right, either of these edits is, is perfectly valid in terms of like the color treatment. You can, you can, you can treat these largely like, a visible light image and you can do whatever you like with the color. In fact, IR Chrome is a really good uh, le uh, filter for sort of emulating fall colors. So, so that, that keep that in mind. You don't really need to do anything special. I don't even need to really edit this. It's not that much different. The, the, the other thing to keep in mind here is that because with, a, with this kind of applies not only this filter, but with a lot of infrared is that it's very easy for the the colors to just become a wash on your screen of, of these solid colors. And so think about that in your shooting, you've got a little bit of these trees here, which is a nice element. You've got a little bit of water and a little bit of sky. Um, look for compositions that give you more of a balance between all of those. So something that gives you a little bit more sky to contrast the trees or a little bit more of a neutral subject but I think you're on the right path. So keep shooting um, and keep looking for interesting subjects. And you can probably process your IR Chrome photos using the Adobe color profile or any other profile you like um, and have fun with it uh, because uh, it's a really easy, 
it's a really easy filter to edit. So thank you, um, uh, Steve, for sending those images in. All righty, let's see here. Let me catch up on comments. Uh, let's see. All right, Spectra will we'll share information when we get to his image here coming up. Uh, let's see. Oh, 3 a.m., wow. Uh, very nice LUTs for IR, thank you. I must take the old Fuji XE1 modified out for a walk. Doing the changes in Lightroom is much more convenient. Glad to have caught a little bit of the life here. Thank you so much for showing up. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, that it's it's impossible to catch everyone's time zone uh, in in a 24 hour period. So I appreciate uh, those of you who show up when it's challenging and and watching the recordings. Thank you so much. All right, let's pull up the next uh, set of images and questions from Greg. So let me get to those here. Let's see. Ah, Greg. Let's see. He sent, oh, this was, this was another case where Greg sent along not only a JPEG and a raw image, but he sent along the XMP, kind of a sidecar file along with it, so I could actually see what his edit looked like as well. So let me pull up this image and that's nice because I can I can see the actual uh, changes that, that that were made all right so let me pull up this image I'll pull up the JPEG first we'll look at his JPEG and then we'll talk about it a little bit and I'll read what he wrote so uh, Greg says um, let's see so first of all Greg had a question which was I struggle with my infrared images not being as sharp as my normal images even when I use live view and focus manually how can I get sharper infrared images? I have a 720 nanometer filter and a converted Nikon D7100. So there's two things that will cause your images to, to not be sharp. And the first one is going to be focus, of course. Uh, and that's, that's definitely a challenge. So uh, like I talked about earlier, uh, making sure that you're using the tools at your disposal to get a good focus is pretty important. Sometimes while, while setting a custom white balance is not essential for white balancing your edited image, sometimes setting a custom white balance can help you see things better in the viewfinder. So if setting a custom white balance helps you to see your image while you're shooting, then go ahead and do that. Even if it's not the actual white balance you use in editing, I have a, I have a custom white balance I, uh, that I set and just leave it for a lot of my cameras just so that I can see better in the viewfinder. So, so that's the first thing is, is make sure your focus is locked in. But the other one is going to be diffraction. Diffraction is the thing that if you're new to infrared, you just may not be aware of. So with a Nikon D7100, I believe that's a crop sensor camera, the, the, the four digit Nikons. And so uh, that uh, crop sensor camera, when I shoot crop sensor on my, my Fuji cameras, and with any crop sensor camera, Nikon, Canon, Sony, etc. you're probably not going to want to shoot uh, any more narrow or higher numbered of an aperture than 5.6. That's really it. You don't want to be at f8. You don't want to be at f11. You really want to be at 5.6 for most infrared. And if you're shooting uh, infrared only, like a like an 830, 850, you might even want to be at f4. So uh, getting into f8 can even cause diffraction with a crop sensor camera. So that's the first thing that I would check. Um, let's see if it's, we've got, you've got 5.6 on this image and this image didn't look bad to me. So, so that, that may, you may just be speaking in general. Um, but, but definitely something to keep an eye out for is, uh, in diffraction is diffraction and making sure that your F stop does not go above 5.6 with a crop sensor camera with a full frame or a medium format camera. I would go F8, no higher than F8. Okay. So let's look at these. Uh, let's talk about this image specifically. Greg says, I'm new to the color swap profiles. Uh, I'd like to be, I'd be interested to see how you would edit my image. Um, this one here, uh, I use, okay. So he's got, he said, I used a profile, the negative 50 RB. Um, so this is the JPEG. If we switch over to the edit version, yep, we can see negative um, 50 RB. We can see the other, the other changes uh, that he made. So some basic edits, increasing the exposure and contrast, 
dropping the highlights, kicking up the shadows. That's very popular in, in, um, when I first started editing raw files, I did that a lot. I don't do it as much anymore, but definitely a popular technique for kind of trying to expand the range, um, adjusting the whites and blacks, kicking up the dehaze, um, and then vibrance and saturation. So, and if I look down to the other settings, it, it looks like you've got some HSL maybe. So a little bit of a sat saturation nudge and dropping the luminance of, let's see, that would have been, that's the blue. So that would have been, did you do that or I did? Let me see. I, I don't know if you did that or I did that messing with it. Um, let's see here. And this, and we've got, these might be, these might be masks that I built. Let me see. Oh, here, let me go back. I've got, I, I saved a, a bookmark of your edit, a snapshot of your edit. So let's go back to your edit. We'll kind of start from there. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember if I, I don't remember if I made it edit, an edit here, so I will just save that and we'll go back to, okay. So it looks like you, 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 this is your edit. You've got a sky mask, you've got an inverted mask. So the sky mask is going to be obviously the sky and then lots of brushes and objects here to help isolate those. You might've had some tricky edges to work around here. Let's look at the overlay so we can kind of see some of the tricky edges you might've had to work with. Uh, an inverted mask, which would pull up, uh, oh yeah, I could start to see somehow some of those edges would have been tricky. So inverted to address the rest of the image, uh, here where you did some adjustment to the blacks, um, texture, etc. Another mask for the bottom of the image to darken this up. I, I really like this choice that you made here because I find a lot of times that stuff in an image like this is going to be very bright. In fact, if I was to take your image, let me turn the overlay off and let me hide this uh, mask, hide this layer for a second. You can see how bright it is. Uh, and it kind of, I think it does distract from the image. So I like I like the way that you uh, highlighted these elements near the lower edge and then just brought down the brightness, the exposure by a third of a stop, brought down the highlights a little bit. Love it. I. I would do that as well, just to help draw attention in towards the house. Um, and then the third, the fourth mask, mask number three, um, it looks like a luminance mask. Let me bring in the overlay here, which it looks like you're using to try to adjust some of the highlights. So it's, it's, it's addressing the highest end of the spectrum and it's bringing the highlights down a little bit. So I, I really like what you've done here. My, if I was to, uh, to do anything else to this image, um, what I would do is probably, you know, me, I would more contrast. I would create more emphasis on the house. This is, this to me is a perfect example of where the, uh, the, the trees are a supporting character. They're a framing element of this image, but the real star of the image is the house. So I would go in and address that. So let me create a mask here and give you an idea of what I would do. I, on top of the edits that you made, cause I think you made a lot of good choices here. So I would go in and do, maybe we'll do an object and I'm going to try to quickly se uh, high, select the house. I'm not going to do a perfect selection here. Uh, we'll see what Lightroom gives me. Fill this in, let Lightroom think for a moment and see what it would do. And then I'll talk a little bit about what, what, uh, what I would want to do with that mask once Lightroom has built the mask. Okay. So Lightroom built it. It did a fair job, not a bad job. That's, it's good enough for me to work with, uh, this mask number four. So as I said, it would, to me, it would be a lot of contrast. And, and the reason I would select the house specifically and not everything but the sky is because I don't want to add, uh, texture and clarity to these trees and to the other elements. I want to limit that to the house. So if I was to add texture and clarity, I would be adding it just here. Uh, I could also work on contrast here. The other thing that's, that's interesting in an image like this is you can really kind of fool the user into thinking an image like this is sharper than it really is. Because if you have the, if you had a lot of sharpness, to this, uh, this structure, 
and you maybe soften up the trees a little bit, it'll create an, a, an apparent sharpness that fools the user into thinking that the image is sharper than it really is. And so this could be uh, something to consider. Like we talked about at the, in that first, those first images, you could also do contrast by dragging some of these uh, dots down and really trying to affect the contrast within, uh, within this space. Um, I might actually bring the highlights up a bit so it's not quite so to, to address things that way. So I might try to create a little bit more contrast within the house itself, and I might also go and soften up or, or add a little bit of negative clarity to soften up some of the trees around. Um, that would probably be the only change that I would really make. I think the other things that you did made a lot of sense. Separating the sky, focusing on that um, uh, from, from other elements of the image, separating out the foreground. I think those are all, all really good choices. The other thing you might try, this is an, just another observation, is when you're working in the basic panel, think of maybe try not to make changes in here first. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes your, your image is underexposed and you've got to make an exposure adjustment. But before you go in and start making adjustments here to the different tones and presence and colors in the basic panel, see what you can do in masks first. I think that the effects tend to be more pronounced and stronger than when you make them to the whole image and they're more general. So just another thing to keep in mind. Uh, but thank you, Greg. I appreciate you sharing the image with us, the the, the JPEG and your edit um, and the, the XMP as well so that I could I could take a look at it, at your edit and add right on top of it. But thank you for sharing this image. It's very nice. All righty, let's see here. Um, Amin says... Hi, Rob. What is your take on using a gray card in IR photography for setting white balance when processing? Uh, and there's another question. We'll answer that first one first. So you certainly can uh, shoot a white card or a gray card or whatever you like. Uh, you don't need to be as picky about, about this, the substance of it. Like, you know, I know, I know an 18% gray card is very popular for photography. You don't need to be quite as picky for infrared. So... It depends, it really depends upon your subject and what, what are the other options in your image to shoot, uh, to, to set a white balance on. So if I have an image that is, let's say, has maybe clouds in the sky or maybe partly cloudy clouds plus blue sky, or if it has other neutral elements like a building or a sidewalk or other elements that I think are neutral enough, then I don't need to carry around a, a separate card to do my white balance. I can use one of those elements in the image to get the white balance that I like. I can white balance on the clouds, white balance on a building, sidewalk, road, whatever. Anything that is devoid of color compared to the other elements, the sky, the foliage, that's what you need to be able to, to set a good white balance. So you certainly can. Now, cases where the white balance could be trickier if you're shooting in the shade, if you don't have any sky or if you don't have any clouds or you don't have any other elements to draw from, if you were shooting indoors, you, maybe you would want to, sh to shoot a card uh, to, to be able to have an extra reference point to draw from. For most of the landscape and travel photography that I do, probably 95 or more percent of it, there's, there's a neutral element that I can draw on to set a white balance. So I don't feel like I need to carry a card around with me. And even when I don't have a, a subject that I can white balance on, I usually feel I, I grow comfortable adjusting the white balance to be able to, to pick what looks good to me. Because again, this is less about trying to get the perfect white balance in visible light. Our eyes are trained to know what, what is white balance and what is not. And so it's that that's why it's so important in visible light to have a good white balance in infrared. It's more of a creative choice. And so being able to be flexible with it is your choice. So I personally don't find the need to carry a white card or a gray card or any other white balance subject with me. I know that, uh, if I can, like, like I mentioned earlier, I'll set a custom white balance, usually just pointing at a sidewalk or something and then just shoot. And then I know that I'll be able to find a good white balance when I get into editing and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, the second question was, 
do people create IR composites from multiple IR photographs? Absolutely. We had one that we looked at in the, uh, the last live stream where there was a, an image of a beach with these really uh, dramatic rock formations. And then there was a, a, a composition of a, of a moon that was placed into that image. So you can absolutely be creative and, and use infrared in combination with other elements. Of course, I would say, much like with any form of photography, if you're sharing your image um, and it's a a venue where the authenticity authenticity of the image is important, then you might say it's a composite. So, for example, if I was sharing it in an infrared group, I might indicate that that was the case. If I was sharing it somewhere where I was in a contest or something, you might have to declare that it was a composite. Uh, but I don't see any problem. There's no like... That's not taboo to, to create composites. It's an it's an artistic choice to do so, and so absolutely go for it if you can if you can create artistic images that meet your vision that are com comprised of multiple images. Then by all means, go ahead and do so. Uh, let's see. Spectra said I've used a white balance card, but I forget if I can get a perfectly fine white balance from a white piece of paper or the white plastic on one of my filter cases. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it's because. Because you're simply looking for neutral colors, you're not or an absence of color. Uh, the 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 nature of the item is less critical uh, than it would be than you know with a visible light where you might want an eighteen percent card or something along those lines. All right, so let's see here. Uh, we looked at uh, Greg's image and. Caught some comments here. Let me catch a quick drink for my throat. Okay. So next up is John. John, are you still with us? Let me let me find some of your images. And we'll get those pulled up. Got a whole variety of images that John shared. Let's see. A variety of images and a ton of questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, one, of your, one of John's questions was, I can't read your actions in my actions panel. How do I resize that panel so I can see everything? Let me open up Photoshop. That'll take a second here. Uh, so I can, I can uh, do that with Photoshop. Let, I'll, let me come back to that. Your next question that you had sent was about a full spectrum conversion using with or without filters in astrophotography. So I haven't, I've done a little bit of astro uh, with infrared cameras. I definitely want to do more, but you, you, you've got a lot of choices. You can shoot full spectrum, um, which could be particularly interesting, say for a Milky Way shot, trying to bring in maybe some extra purples or colors uh, that, that, that could come through in the image. That could be really nice. You could use a specific infrared filter, or you could use uh, an astro specific filter, like a dual band filter. Like you could use a hydrogen, hydrogen alpha filter. You could use a dual band that would be like hydrogen alpha plus oxygen three, uh, for example. So there's a variety of things that you can do with, with a full spectrum camera. Um, and so, I've got a, one of those dual band filters that's got hydrogen alpha and oxygen three. I'd like to try that at some point. Uh, but, but I, but I've also done a little bit of shooting full spectrum and I find that you just get, you get a ton of color. You get a lot of options when you're shooting, particularly the Milky Way, but it really depends on what your subject is. Uh, that's going to have a big impact on it as well. Whether you're shooting uh, a broader landscape with a Milky Way or whether you're shooting like, um, a nebula, in which case a, a more narrow band filter like a hydrogen alpha or oxygen three or sulfur would could produce better uh, sharpness um, and really pull out the thing you're looking for. And then of course, the other factor you've got to deal with is just light pollution. So full spectrum will bring in all of the colors, but it could also bring in uh, a, um, all of the, um, <laughs> the, the light pollution that's in your area. So depending on where you are in terms of your light sources, that could have an impact and using one of those filters might allow you to, uh, uh, avoid, uh, some of that light pollution. All right. So that allowed me to open up Photoshop here. 
I'm going to take a cough drop here so I can get through this without hacking up a storm. So let's see, let me pull up uh, Photoshop here. You had talked about the, uh, the action panel um, and resizing it. So if you haven't used the action panel in Photoshop, you can get to it through Windows Actions. Or you can, and in this case, I've got it open here, and it's opened up here on the right. So you've got a you've got a variety of choices here. Within this side panel, I can make adjustments to the whole panel to adjust how it's read. I have loaded up a few of my different packs of actions. So I've got my, I've got the version two that I did previously. I've got version three of my actions, which is the most recent. Uh, that are that the, these are the most common ones that I use. And then I also have these extras, version three extras, which is a whole variety of experimentation with the channel mixer and things. But that's what I'm looking at is these three different groups. I'll open up the actions version three since this is the one that I most commonly use. So the other thing that I can do here is I can take this panel and I could grab the tab and I could rip it off and have it be a floating panel. And so that I can see it this way. So that would be another way to be able to uh, to, to view this. Another thing you should be aware of is if you were to open up an individual action, you could certainly see all of the pieces that comprise it, but you don't necessarily need to worry about those. You don't need to, I, I rarely, once once the action's built, I rarely open this up and look at these. So you, you definitely don't need to. All you need to do is select an action and then hit the play button and it will play back the action, action and then perform your perform your color swap. So let's see here. This, if I click this arrow up here, it'll reduce it to a little, a little icon. And let me show you what that looks like back in the, we'll, we'll put this back in the side panel. Now, if I was to, uh, once it's in the side panel, that might be, that might be one of the challenges you're looking at is if you, is if you have the action panel sort of shrunk and you only see this play button, you're definitely going to have a hard time seeing what it is that you're that, that you're clicking, and if I if I dock it here, um, then I can see the panel. But I yeah, I would have to open it up to be able to see things. So everybody, you have to sort of get um, um, get comfortable with uh, the way that the panels work and where you want them docked. Do you want them to be part of this side panel, or do you want them to be free floating? And it just depends on. Uh, what what it is that you're doing the actions I tend to have docked because I don't use them I only use them once and then I put them away something like properties I could see coming out because the properties can be very different in different images so you might pull that out or if you had a ton of layers I guess you could pull that out uh, so different different ways that you could manage that there might if you're if you're having challenges with the size of things you might there might be a setting in in the preferences that affect the, the overall resolution of these things, or you might have to play with your monitor uh, resolution. So for example, this monitor that I'm looking at, it's a, it's a what, what, what do they call it? Like a 4K, so like 3800 by 2160 or something. And that's very high resolution. And for my aging eyes, it's really hard to see. And then within Windows, I have to do a 150 or 200% magnification to get all the apps to display at a reasonable size so that I can see things so that everything is not super tiny. And the same thing on my Mac, I have to kind of do the same thing as well when I'm, when I'm looking at things on a big display like this. So it, it, it could be your, the way your panels are, or it could be, uh, the resolution settings you have in windows or Mac that could affect that. Uh, let's see, there was a comment here as well. Uh, the old Photoshop, uh, could be run off offline. Not, yeah, not the new stuff. Uh, let's see. Oh, let me go back a little bit here. Oh, Phil said on Saturday the lemon pick was fluorescing in ultraviolet. Was the pick taken in infrared or an unmodified camera in natural light? I believe that it was an infrared image taken with a probably like a 590 or a, a 720 nanometer filter. The the if if you had a purely ultraviolet light, it, it wouldn't capture that. So there's there was clearly something else going on there, but I don't think we had all the technical details. I think that, um, but it was a beautiful image and and definitely you know fascinating to look at and 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 showed the 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 things that you could do with a still life with infrared. So I would definitely experiment with that. 
yeah so so might it might have been a 720 in purely uv light uh but but the result uh, was absolutely fascinating i'd like to do more um indoor uh in infrared myself maybe maybe winter is, is a good time for that let's see phil says in astro much depends on the target infrared is great for nebula but not so great for planetary star clusters dedicated cooled astro cameras are are full spectrum so uh, there, there's a there's a little bit uh, more detail there, so definitely. Oh, and then uh, Anne Schul says to add what Phil said: shooting stars in infrared makes them very bloated, so they don't come out sharp. Oh, so that that's good to know as well. That's why I I I think that um, uh, there's a preference towards those narrow band filters. Uh, but again, it depends on the it depends on the subject you're shooting. Let's go back to the questions that uh, John had. Uh, John had said. Uh, regarding Pixelmator, has the app been updated in three years since your first video? Yes, it was three years ago that I made those. I made a video on Pixelmator for the iPad and Pixelmator Pro. Um, and then he says, do you still say it's better than Lightroom and Photoshop on the iPad? Is the best available? What is the best for the iPad currently? Um, what is the best program on the Mac with the Pro version? So... I, uh, this last week I reopened, uh, Pixelmator. They, they've, they've changed the, they've started to change the names of things, which is a little frustrating. So the, the, what used to be called Pixelmator or Pixelmator for the iPad is now Photomator, but it's also available on the Mac. So it's Mac, iPad, and iPhone, and it, and it can sync across all three. And from my my tests, it can actually do everything you need to do need to do in infrared. It still has an amazing user interface. It's still super easy to swap colors. It's still great at white balancing. And now the fact that you can run it on the Mac is even better. So you get you could buy one subscription, uh, which is pretty affordable, and use it across uh, a Mac, uh, notebook or desktop, the iPad and the iPhone. That is. Photomator. Now they they have another program that is more of a higher end program called Pixelmator Pro. Still retains that original name. That version is trying to add more Photoshop like features. So it has, well, it it has a lot of features. It's not just like Photoshop. It has video editing. It now has PDF editing. So it can be more of a compositing layering tool, and it still has all of the same features. So I've done a bunch of this research in the last week. So I'm hoping to put out a new video that would cover both of these, that would cover both Photomator and Pixelmator Pro. The, the, the short version is they still look great and they're still great for infrared. So great tools if you're on the Mac because they're, it's a Mac only environment. The, um, uh, the other question kind of relating to um, Photoshop is, uh, I haven't tested the latest version of Photoshop to see how good it is. If it can even open raw files, there was some crazy limitations when I last checked that. Uh, but Lightroom, the Lightroom that is available for the iPad and the iPhone is very compatible with synced with the libraries that you use in Lightroom or the synced collections in Lightroom Classic. And I use it all the time. So I, I edit photos in uh, the iPad all the time and have them synced over to Lightroom Classic. It works great. It uses all my profiles. It does everything I need. So uh, that's still a great platform for working on the iPad. And occasionally I'll even use it on my iPhone. Not as much, but occasionally. So I, actually, it's on my iPhone, it's nice to be able to look up the settings of an image that I had synced and say, oh, what did I use for that? You know, maybe I'm maybe I'm posting to Instagram and I want to say, oh, what profile did I use? Or what were the settings for that image? I can look that up in Lightroom on my, on my phone, on my iPhone, and I can find all that detail without having to look on my iPad or look on my computer. So that's really nice. So Lightroom is still a great platform for working on mobile. I'll check Photoshop um, and maybe do another video on it to see where it's at because it was disappointing to say the least. Um, it was, I don't know who they were targeting it at. They were, they, they, they were not targeting at photographers. I'll say that. Um, the first version of, of iPad for, for the i the first version of Photoshop for the iPad and even the, the next couple versions. I'm the, not only were they not, obviously they're not, nobody targets anything at infrared, but, but I don't even think it was targeted photography. It just didn't have 
it, I think it was targeted at compositing and trying to be like a, I don't know, like a Canva, you know, going after Canva or whatever. I don't know what that, I don't know what they were doing. Uh, let's see. So another question that John had, and then we'll look at some images from John. Um, let me, well, let me pull up one of the images before I, before I read here. Let me, I think I just got them up in Lightroom. Yeah. So here's some images from, uh, from John. I'll pull up this first image. We'll look at his first image while I'm reading the last question. I'm using a Nikon Z5 with a full spectrum conversion. I'm only able to set a custom white balance without any external lens filters. Will this have any effect on white balance depending on which filter I use, or should I just use your infrared profile pack and set a, a white balance during post advantages or disadvantages? So you've got a full spectrum conversion. If you're shooting raw, you will have full control over the white balance and editing full control. So as I alluded to earlier, you can certainly set a custom white balance when you're shooting, but you absolutely don't need to. Uh, I do it just for convenience to make things look good in the viewfinder, but I set all my white balances in editing. It's vastly easier and you have vastly more control. So I definitely prefer that approach. Um, so you can set a white balance when you're editing, but absolutely shoot raw and you'll have full control either way. Um, let's see. Only set a white, a custom white balance without, yeah. See, if you can only do it, the, the, the Nikon sensors are weird. And I don't know, I don't know the reason for this, but some Nikon sensors are, have a very difficult time setting a custom white balance. Uh, in camera. And so this is, this tends to be more of a challenge with, uh, with Nikon. So definitely, uh, you know, be sure to edit your white balance in post-production. Um, let's see. I'm going to check some comments here and then we'll look at some of John's images. Phil said, I found the black spots on bananas to fluoresce in blue. It's a weird, weird world. There you go. That there's a new, a new interesting subject uh, to check out. And he says he has to go. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. I'll catch the recording. Thanks, Phil, for stopping by. Uh, and then uh, Anshul says, I find Affinity Photo to be the most powerful iPad app for editing. Has 95% plus of the feature parity with the desktop version. Um, Affinity Photo is a, a really strong editor. So uh, that's good to hear that the that the iPad version is so strong. I don't think I don't think that I've tried that one, uh, but I've tried the desktop one for sure, uh, and that's a very strong editor. All right, so let's look at some of these um, images uh, that John sent. Here's a lovely image from oh, what's the name of this? It's San, it's San Diego. I remember it's I know it's San Diego. I've taken a picture of that tower before. That's how I know. I've taken a whole bunch of pictures of this Balboa, maybe Balboa Park um, in San Diego. I seem to remember. So this is a very nice image. I'm going to pull up. Let's see here. I'm going to see. I'm going to pull up my, my tab here so I can see if these are JPEGs or RAWs. That's a JPEG image. So here's a raw image. So we can take a look at these. Maybe we'll pick one of these to edit. So this has got a nice, this is an inch. Oh, you've got the, that sunburst is screaming high F stop to me. So danger. Danger Will Robinson uh, with the high. And now, of course, I have done this very thing. I have shot an image with a high f-stop because I wanted a starburst. Uh, so perfectly valid uh, shooting. Uh, obviously, the the subject, the draw of this image is going to be the starburst. Um, and so you're just that you're going to accept some diffraction in the image. So I'm not. I'm definitely not knocking it. I've done it. Uh, but just FYI, something to be aware of. But but nice use of a. Nice use of a starburst there. Ooh, this is kind of a nice image. Nice, nice little town here, rolling hills. He's, this is this is just successfully making me miss California is what this is doing. Oh, this is a really nice image. We've got this uh, old uh, looks like a looks like some kind of a mining or um, building here. That's kind of fascinating. Got a couple views of that. That's very cool. This is, let's see, this is a different camera. This is a Olympus. I'm going to just go into the develop module here and see if I can set a white balance. See what this looks like. Look at all of the color that exists in that boat. All the organic life that the water, uh, the water and the wood 
has created over time. That's absolutely fascinating. I love shooting uh, the edge of water when you can see all the color that exists in the rocks, uh, all of the organic life that's there. It's absolutely fascinating. Nice lighthouse in the distance. Oop, a little overexposed. Nice, nice subject though. Beautiful subject. Oh, and a lovely tree. Lovely tree. So that's beautiful. I that's a that's a really gorgeous tree. Let's go back. I want to go back and edit this. Uh, this one of this this. Uh, Looks like a mining town image here. Let me set this up and head into. Oh, let's see. Somebody's Stacy saying audio is in and out for me, but mostly out. I seem to be getting a good audio level here, but if anybody else, oh, somebody else can't hear me as well. Let's see. <clears throat> Let me do a quick reset of my stream and we'll see if that fixes the problem. Okay, so I did a little reset there. So let me know if that's helping with the audio. The levels look pretty good on my end and YouTube is saying things are looking good. So please let me know what you're seeing on your, if you're hearing me fine or if there's any problems. Let me take a look at, at, at this image. Let me pick a profile and do some edits here. I will, I'm gonna select the infrared temp negative 100 and white balance on the clouds. Start to pull out some of the color here that gives us a nice gold sky and a little bit of a blue tone here. Let me just add a comment. Okay. So I just added a comment to let everybody know that I reset the stream and then I can continue with this edit. So this is, let me do a quick uh, color swap here and see what we, what kind of options we've got here. I've got my hue, which would just as 180 degree switch of all the colors. I've got invert, which is a little fancier, but creates a little bit more different, different, uh, tones in the in the highlights and the shadows but but a very similar color result we've got the the red blue swap which is just it's like a channel mixer red blue swap so it tends to be a little bit more um teal in the sky hint more maybe orangish or pinkish in the in the grass we've got the the dramatic green to blue which gives us this purple yellow color uh, the dramatic green to red, which um, creates more of a green teal sky and a pink uh, foliage, and then a split, which tends to neutralize some of the colors and give us a pretty realistic sky. Let me pick that one for now. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Sounds like people are having... The audio issues are not affecting everyone. I hope it's getting better. Uh, the, the levels seem good on my end, and... YouTube is telling me that the stream is healthy. So let's continue this edit. So I'm going to uh, use the mask and do a sky, select sky. And we'll start with the sky, try to bring out a little bit more of the contrast here. P probably through dehaze is my favorite sky editing tool because it has a tendency to really separate the clouds and create a lot of punch between the clouds and blue sky. So I like to use that pretty aggressively. I'm going to right click on that mask and do a duplicate and invert. This will give me a mask of everything but the sky. Uh, and from here I can do similar things, but a little bit different. I'll, I'll focus here more on texture and clarity. I will go up to contrast and add some contrast. And then I'll probably add more contrast through the curve by adding some strong contrast there. So that really kind of punches things up. Now, I'm liking the direction this is going, but this foreground is very commanding. It's very bright. So I think I'll create another mask 
and use a linear gradient and drag up from the bottom and just sort of probably there's a couple ways you could go here you could either you could either reduce the exposure that would be one way to do it a lot of times i'll just reduce the exposure by a stop or a third of a stop half top stop two thirds of a stop that's one way to do it another way to do it would be to just go down to the curve and put a single point in and drag down this can give you a very similar effect you'll you'll still retain a lot of a lot of the contrast though if you do it this way so either way is fine. This will give you more contrast overall. The exposure will sort of bring all the levels down. I like this, but I might, I'm going to add another dot up here and bring down the highlights a hair as well. So that'll make them a little less contrast in the foreground. Now, the other thing that I might do is look at the town itself. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make a change here. I'm going to go back to that inverted mask where I added a lot of texture and clarity, and I'm gonna pull that out, because I don't wanna apply it to everything. I wanna apply it to just the buildings. So let me do another mask of brush, and I this is, I'll do a quick mask here. Uh, that'll just give me the buildings. You can spend more time. I would normally spend more time on something like this, maybe a couple minutes to, to get it good, but I'll just do a quick version here. And then this will allow me to come in and just apply the texture and clarity only to the, the buildings to try to get them to pop a little bit more from, from the, the landscape. If, if I apply these effects to the entire landscape, then it all kind of blends in together for me. And sometimes I like to, to separate them out a little bit. So this is really interesting. I like, I like the pop that that's giving me. I'm going to get a little bit more. Throw, eh, that's too much contrast. Sometimes I, I don't want to ever say too much contrast. It's not typically in my vocabulary, but this is, a, you've got a lot of, you got a really strong light source here. So maybe that's the case here. Um, so yeah, I like the direction. You know, you maybe, you know, you might have to pull up some of the, some of the blacks uh, or some of the shadows here in the city itself to get it to pop a little bit. Oh, that's, yeah, that's nice. So now you're getting, by doing that, and by doing it just in the buildings, I'm getting a little bit more of the detail, the distressed wood that's kind of coming out. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see kind of that in some of the buildings. I really like the look of that. So this is, uh, this is a very lovely image. I love the, I love the, you've got all those classic elements. You've got, you know, some sky. You've got these beautiful rolling buildings. I love, I love, um, this, you know, typically I know that a lot of infrared landscapes are shot midday with this full on sun, but I've definitely done some morning shoots in the rolling hills and some evening shoots where you get this very harsh light. Um, uh, it, it's harsh in infrared, and but it actually, I think, adds a lot of characters to image. So thank you, John, for sending in all of these images. Uh, this is, uh, they're very nice and they make me uh, long for the day when I will be back in California, either either the San Diego area or the Bay area. I've spent time in both areas uh, and love shooting in the rolling hills uh, with infrared. It's fantastic. All righty, let's see here. Um, let me do a quick time check. Oh, the time flies so fast. So fast the time flies. Let's see how we're doing here. Uh, but, you know, getting getting down to... Oh, let's see. We might, I might be able to sneak it all in. We'll see. All right. So let's see. Kathleen sent an image. Let me pull up the image that Kathleen sent. We'll talk about it. Uh, let's see. Okay. So Kathleen sent a, both a, a JPEG and a raw image if we want to take a look at it. So let's start by taking a look at the JPEG image. Let me pull that up. And then I will cough briefly. Okay, so Kathleen says, please edit as you wish and give a critique of my edited version. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at this. This is the <clears throat> this is the JPEG version that Kathleen shared. Uh, so very nice, beautiful, beautiful bridge, nice lines. You got the details with uh, these boats in the background, kind of a little pop there. Got this moody sky. 
So very nice. I think this is a this is a very nice image. Um, th- th- this is not a criticism, but part of my my brain says, is there anything that you could um, make a little brighter? Because it's it's a it's a somewhat dark image. But I don't know. I mean that that may be kind of the point of it. It might work that way. If I if I brought up the exposure, you know, it just reveals more, and I'm not sure that makes it a better image. Um, I could maybe bring up the highlights a little bit. I guess that would focus a little bit more on the boats. Maybe maybe a, a smidge of highlights uh, would be my recommendation. But you know, really, I, I really like what you've done there. Let's take a look at the let's take a look at the raw version and see what you had to work with. So uh, let's see here nearby let me go back to my grid view g for grid my, my most common keyboard shortcuts in in lightroom are g for grid e for i think it's loop which is the single view in the in the library and then d for develop use those all the time to jump back and forth there on my views so this is the this is the Raw version, you can see already that there's some color in this. So let's pick up a, just for kicks, I know that Kathleen edited this as black and white, but let's look at the color, see what we've got here. If I white balance on uh, the clouds, oh, let me try the other t- the other profile. Now it's actually the 100 is better. So if I use the infrared temp negative 100, I can get a good white balance. Now I can see uh, what's going on with this image. I'm going to do a quick auto, just kind of... All right. So I have this... this The challenges in this image are very familiar to me because I have shot a lot of images that have these challenges. What you've got here is, first of all, and, and I think this is what would push this to be a monochrome image, a black and white image, is, number one, you have no blue sky. So it's 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 completely overcast. So the sky is out, so you're not going to get any color there. Second of all, the color is not part of the main subject. The main subject is this bridge, uh, and it doesn't have any color at all. It's completely neutral. There's maybe a hint of blue coming through because of the white balance I've selected, but it's basically a neutral uh, element. And so the the blue uh, around it is... Uh, could be either a a complete distraction or a mild distraction, depending on your perspective. Um, So I can definitely see where, and and you're not going to get rid of it. Clearly there's no crop that's going to, that's going to eliminate that without uh, taking it out of the image entirely. And so, uh, you know, if you were to edit this as a color image, whether I left it this way or swap the color, even if I swap the color, what's going to happen is that, your attention is going to be drawn to the color. You know, it's going to be drawn away from the bridge. If I, let's say I like this version. Well, you know, that's, I like the color, but, but my eye is now drawn to this tree here and this here, and maybe some of the, the elements here, and it's less drawn to the bridge, which is kind of the main subject. And so to me, the color is kind of a distraction, um, in this image. Uh, and so I can definitely see the appeal of making this a monochrome image. So let's let's go back and look at the monochrome version. So yeah, I mean, you know, you could I guess you could you could make a case for maybe if you if you were to brighten up the foliage and make it whiter, it would still be a distraction in this case. So um, I I think Kathleen, I think you did a great job with this image. I think you I think that this sort of dark and moody view, especially what you've done with the clouds that, you know, really emphasizes the structure of the bridge. Um, and you've really drawn my eye to the main subject, to these, to these arches that exist here, you know, this, the main arch here, and then the secondary arch, my eye is really drawn to those. I think in the color version, my eye isn't even drawn to, I don't even notice the secondary arch. It's like hidden back there. Um, and I barely notice all these boats because they don't have color. So I, I like what you've done. I've done this. Sometimes I will deliberately shoot something knowing that I want to make it a monochrome image at the end. Sometimes I will shoot a 590. This is probably a 590 because um, uh, it's got a lot of color. And, and, and then get to the edit and realize, well, there's just the color version isn't working for me. So I think what you've done here is great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin says, I think that's the 
the Uquina Bay Bridge in Newport, Oregon. Great place. It's a very, it's a lovely structure. So uh, thank you, Kathleen, for sharing with that, sharing that image with us. I think you did a great job and I am not going to attempt to improve it any more than, uh, so I, I, okay, I made, I, I made a slight tweak, but like, no, I think you, I think you did an excellent job. Uh, let's see here. Up next is Spectra. Spectra, are you still here? Uh, I don't know if you, if you are still here, um, but let me find the image that you shared. And, and if you're still here, please tell us about this image. Tell us the details. Cause I don't think you, you didn't share any of these details in, uh, with me. And so while I'm finding the image, go ahead and let us know, uh, what this image is. So let me go ahead and find it. I got to make sure I'm my, my, you know, pro tip, the shortcut keys only work when you're pointing to the right program. Uh, then, then that's when they work. Otherwise they don't work at all. All right. So there we go. So <clears throat> this looks, uh, this looks so familiar. So let me talk about the location first, and then I'll talk about the image. Cause this looks so familiar to me. Uh, there's a, um, I can't remember the name of it. There was, I think a state park just south of Monterey Bay that had very similar landscape to this, this, these grasses and the trees. So I don't know. I don't know where you shot this. I'd, I'd be curious to know where you shot this, but it looks a lot like a state park just south of uh, Monterey Bay, California. So let's talk about the image itself. Um, you've got a lot, a lot going on here. Uh, oh, so your comment is, so I, this is a faux aerochrome look shot with a Tiffin 12 filter. Oh, interesting. I don't think that I've heard of that. What is the 12 filter? I believe the filter has a cut around 530 nanometers, but I'm not totally sure. If that's the case, it would kind of be uh, like an orange filter. Uh, I'd be curious if you did a color swap on this um, to get these colors or if that was normal. If it's if it's a 530, that would put it right in line with an orange filter. And that would, that would certainly explain the really um, strong color saturation that you've got here. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, that's, that's not a, that's not a specific filter. I've heard of there's so many filters, you know, it's one of the things that's fascinating to me is how there are so many filters that were created, especially the, of course, the Kodak Rattan filters, uh, of old were created to create different tonal looks for black and white film photography. And the fact that so many of those filters are now what we use uh, as tools in infrared. Um, and so that's completely fascinating to me, uh, that, that we've, that even though they were created for a very different purpose and they were created to affect the tonality of a black and white film image, that we can still use those filters now because the way the cutoffs work, they work great for infrared. So it's fascinating. Uh, next time I'll send you the raws, there is a channel swap. So, yep. Um, the filter blocks blue. So the blue channel is IR only. I subtracted that from the two other channels. So definitely could be a, uh, let's see, then swap. Uh, so the colors represent what they do in aerochrome IR to red, um, IR red and green as RGB. So, so moving the color. So not just a simple, um, swapping of colors, but an actual adjustment of the assignments, much like happens in aerochrome film, uh, where, where you're, 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 the replacements are happening. So red, uh, IR becomes red. Uh, the red light becomes green and then the, uh, the green light becomes blue. Um, uh, so I think that's what you're, what you're suggesting here, but, but definitely like creating those, those more complex assignments of color, as opposed to just a swapping of the red and the blue. But I love the, I love the color. Um, I like the, I like the fact that you've got not just the, this really bold red and the blue, but you've got this like hint of green in the neutrals in the pathway. Um, uh, and I think that that works really well. So it's a great, very nice shot. Um, uh, great balance in both the composition and in the color. Uh, so very nice. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I'll have to try that, that your technique. Um, I, I've, I've made some notes. I think, I think I have a, um, you know, I make these, these notes for all the videos that I'm going to be making in the future. And I've got one about aerochrome and the specific, uh, changes that happen in aerochrome to convert from 
the what it captures to what is actually recorded and i think i was going to at some point try to do something similar to this uh to to see if i what what that would what the resulting uh look would be uh for aerochrome uh thank you so much i'd be happy to send you more information on our process i do all this in dark table oh lovely um excellent yeah i, I would i would love to hear more about the or or, or see the the um maybe a little bit longer form version of, of your description of the channel swapping. Cause I think that's fascinating and I'd love to be able to experiment with this love dark table. Uh, fascinating image. Where was it shot? You gotta tell me where it was shot. I'm curious. I'm, I could be totally wrong, but you know, where, where was it shot? I'm curious. You haven't said anything. So I'm, I'm guessing it was somewhere else, but I'd be curious to know where it was shot. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing spectra. I appreciate it. All righty. Let's see here. Next up. We have Ann Schul, who's been waiting patiently as well. Uh, so let me pull up and let me find his images. Uh, let's see. Okay, we've got a few images here, uh, some raws and a zoom and a question. So let me pull up uh, one of these images while while I read your question. All right, so let's see, for the first image, oh, I should have made sure that I was pulling up the, the right image. Uh, let's see, title, may, oh, maybe number one, maybe it's this one. Uh, I think this is it. Uh, for the first image, I'd love to see your take on the image and any critiques for my edit. So this is the edit that you did uh, in JPEG. Fun fact, I used Torch from your Creative Infrared Profiles as a starting point for this image. So Torch was one of the uh, creative LUTs uh, that's contained in the uh, in the LUT pack, uh, which can be used in a variety of programs, not so much Adobe programs, but that can be used in other programs. Um, so I, I, I really, we, were, we kind of talked about this earlier with, I think it was Martin's image, the, uh, the focus on the bark. So I really love uh, what, how bark looks in infrared. I don't know. I call me weird. Um, uh, but there's just something about the way that bark looks in infrared that I find really fascinating. Um, and so I love, I love kind of close-ups of that and what the, what infrared can do to the texture. So, uh, I love, I love the look of that here that you've got here. I think you had another version that was a raw version. And yeah, I mean, I would, I can't, you know, the only thing that I would, the only, uh, suggestion that I would really give, uh, for, for this image is maybe, um, I think I already did. Yeah, I already did this is, is really a crop. Um, so if I go back to the original, uh, let's see, hit R key to get out of the crop tool. So this was your original edit. And I think that the, 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 the only things that throw me is this little dark spot down here in the bottom right hand corner. And then you've got a little bit of uh, foliage up here at the top that I think is just kind of distracting. And if you were to go and instead of as, as the, the aspect ratio was shot in, if you were to change it to like a five by four uh, and then just do a little bit of nudging here, you could, I think, just tighten up the composition of this image. Um, you get rid of some of those distractions at the top and the bottom, and then you can just really um, laser focus in on um, on the, uh, on the bark, which I think is, uh, looks excellent here. Uh, let's see, you had another question. Um, oh, so this was, um, <clears throat> let me pull this other image up, uh, for files titled unknown pattern. I've noticed a pattern in all of my images from a full spectrum camera. So let me find that image. There was, I think you've got some other images here, but let me pull up the, the zoomed in crop you had. Um, let's see, this might look a little, might be hard to see and might look a little low res here, um, on the stream, but it is basically kind of a noisy, kind of a wormy pattern like we saw earlier. Uh, let me finish reading what you said. Um, I believe it was due to some anti-alias filter being removed during the conversion process, but I was wondering if there's an effective way to deal with this. Topaz Denoise usually seems to handle this quite well. But sometimes I record time lapses, which take a lot of time for Topaz to go through all the images. So I don't like what it does in those situations. Uh, this frame is one of those, um, and a time lapse that you've shared. 
Um, <clears throat> and then, and then you've shared a time lapse. So let me let me find the image here. I think you've got this image. And if I zoom in on, let me go to the develop module, and let me zoom in on this image. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go way in. I'm gonna go to like 300% and look at the clouds here, just so you can see it. So you can start to see. You might be able to see. It's kind of hard to see. I'm gonna I'm gonna go into 400%. I I almost never look at anything at 400%. It's too depressing. But I'm trying to do that here so you can see kind of the noise pattern that exists here. Uh, he says it's like a, um, oh, Spectra tells me that the image was shot in upstate New York. Well, that's the other coast, but still still a lovely shot. Uh, the landscape just looks similar. Um, let's see. It looks like a Tetris pattern for this image, but I also sent you a raw. So, yeah, here's the raw where I can zoom in at. And, and so... A couple, like kind of like we talked about earlier, uh, with with some of the noise challenges. Let's see here. So you're already shooting. This image is at ISO three twenty, so you're already pretty low. I mean, anything below, you know, eight eight hundred should eight hundred or lower. You shouldn't have to. That's that's probably good. Um, this was a. Let me see what camera you have here. This is a. Um, an A six thousand. So crop sensor, you're shooting f8. I might recommend 5.6. Now that's again for diffraction. That's not going to cause this noise pattern, but just something, just a consideration. Um, so use your use a keep the ISO low. Use 5.6 or lower for a crop sensor. For the noise, you're kind of um, the ISO. The lowest ISO you can get is going to be the number one thing that you're going to want to do to eliminate the noise. That's, that's first of all. The next thing that you're going to want to do is have to do it in, in a program. So it depends on how you're handling your individual images. If you're doing it, I don't know if doing it in Lightroom is going to be any faster or better than doing it in Topaz Denoise. That might be faster and better. In Lightroom, what you're going to want to do is, again, avoid too much sharpening. Or if you do sharpen, use a mask to you know really uh, reduce that so that you're not sharpening the noise because you don't want to sharpen the noise for sure. And then the other thing you're going to want to do is do the um, this uh, noise reduction. You could do noise reduction and that will knock it out pretty effectively for an image like this. Looks great. I don't see any noise now, even at 50. So that looks great. But again, if you're doing a time lapse and you're going to have to do this to a lot of images, that could be challenging. Now, Lightroom does have a, it's a new relatively new denoise feature where I can click this and what it'll do is it will load up the image and give me some settings like in the panel here, but then will save me a new raw file, a new DNG file. So I can look at the, the version it's going to load it up here um, and I can see what it looks like with this amount of denoise applied and I can adjust the amount. I can also, uh, click and hold to remove the effect to see the original so I can see original and then release my mouse to see the improved version and then I can click enhance. Now, the problem with this, this is great if you're working on a single image that has a lot of noise, but the estimated time is 10 minutes. That's that's ridiculous for a single frame from a crop sensor. You, you, that... I. That's not even, that's barely tolerable for one image. If you're doing a time lapse, forget about it. You're not going to want to like run hundreds of images through 10 minutes each. I, I have to believe that uh, Topaz Denoise is faster than that. I don't know that it is, but it's, it's a specialized tool that people rave about. So I have to imagine. So this is an option that the, the setting, I guess it depends upon your workflow is really what it comes down to. How do you process? I've done some time lapses, some infrared time lapses. And typically what I've done is I will, um, I don't have, I don't have a good example here, but like if you go to, if I, if I completely edit one image and then if I go back to the library view and I select a whole bunch of images, I can select sync settings down here in the lower right hand corner this will pull up the treatment. So if I do my treatment, all my basic stuff, even masks, 
and then certainly my detail sharpening, all that kind of stuff. I can, I can hit apply, pick the things I want and I could apply them to whole. So I, I did a, um, a time lapse with probably, I don't know, a thousand or 2000 frames, individual frames. And I, I edited a single frame in Lightroom. Then I did this and I applied the same settings across all 2000 frames and I hit synchronize and I walked away. It didn't take, I don't think it took 10 minutes. Um, I don't remember how long it took, but it was, again, it was just applying the same, uh, develop module settings to each frame. And then once I did that, then I exported all of them. So that would be one way to do it. But again, that, that requires probably the, the most difficult part of that would have been importing the images into Lightroom. So importing 2000 images into Lightroom would have been the slow part of that doing the, the develop module settings and then applying it across all of them was probably not the slow part. And then of course you've got an export on top of that. So it depends on the workflow you've got. I don't know. I haven't used Topaz denoise enough to know if that's a better workflow or not. Um, so I can't give you like specific guidance there, but definitely what you're dealing with is going to be some combination of sharpening and denoise either minimize or mask the sharpening. And then, um, for noise, you know, apply the noise reduction, uh, and then the, choosing the right tool is the tricky part. I don't deal with a lot of noise because most of my images are shot in broad daylight with a low ISO. Uh, and even the, even the time lapses I've done have not had a lot of noise. Um, and so it's, it's not been an issue I've dealt with that much. Most of the noisy images that I have tend to be shot in the shade or on really days where I happen to be out shooting and it's raining and, and I have to cr crank up my ISO. Um, those are the conditions that I find myself with a lot of noise, but it just doesn't, it, I don't have to deal with it very often. Let's take a look at the time lapse that you shared. Um, so we could take a look at that. Hopefully this comes across, um, in the stream. I'll just let it play here and maybe play it a couple times here so you can kind of see how it looks. So that's awesome. Love the, love the cloud action. Now, of course you've got, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to rain on your parade cause this is very nice, but like the eyes are going to be very drawn to these dust spots. Um, and that's another area where like, if you were to, I know it's time, but bringing all of these in and batch processing them to like get rid of the dust spots would be another thing that could help, you know, uh, improve, improve the look of these so that, so that you're not the, 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 the viewer isn't being distracted by those. So, but I love the movement of the clouds and the, the effect of the shadows on the ground. So this is awesome. Very nice. Let me catch up on your comments here. I use a batch processing with macros actions, which files through any processing task. I guess I need to figure out noise reduction and affinity that can work with macros. Yep. Uh, definitely. Is the stuttering only on stream or for you as well? I see in, in, in the image, I see a little bit of, of, <clears throat> I don't know if it's stuttering or if it's just the speed. Well, there's, there's like hiccups that I think maybe that's probably what you're referring to. That's like Lightroom. Uh, Lightroom's doing that. So I don't think it's the stream. There's this weird pause that happens about the eight second mark. Let me start it over again. At about eight seconds, there's a kind of a pause. There's five seconds. Yeah, it, it might be. It was at a different point that time. Let me play it one more time to, to be sure. Play it one more time. It might be my machine kind of caching it at different times or hiccuping it at different points. Now, it's at, it seems to be at five seconds. It could be... <laughs> it could be Lightroom. It could be Lightroom doing this. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't look... It, it. I have no doubt that it doesn't look nearly as good on the stream. Let me, let me see if I can find the file outside of Lightroom and see if it'll play back better. I bet, you know, cause Lightroom's not like when I, when I put together a, um, uh, a, a time lapse, I'm using Lightroom to, to build the time lapse, but I am not using it to, <laughs> to play back the time lapse. Cause it's just, I don't think it's very good at video. Oh, okay. Hang on here. All, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to do your time-lapse justice here by, by showing it in another program. So let me, let me get this te teed up here and we'll bring this up. Uh, let's see here. All right. All right. So now ignore, ignore all the time-lapses you've seen up to this point. 
And now look at this one. Hopefully this one will look, this is dramatically smoother. It's just Lightroom. The playback in Lightroom is terrible. This looks, this looks way better. Uh, the clouds look amazing in this one. So awesome. That looks awesome. I'm going to play it one more time because it's so awesome. The clouds are just amazing. Hopefully it looks better on the stream this time uh, without the without the crazy Lightroom stuff. So kudos to you. Uh, I know how hard it is to do these um, time lapses. They take a lot of work, and uh, but the results are impressive. So so kudos to you. That looks great. Um, and I would say shoot more, shoot more. Um, and, and you'll probably get better at it and they'll look even better. Uh, but, but yeah, that looks fantastic. So thank you for sharing with that with us. I appreciate it. And good luck with your, um, noise reduction workflow that, the, 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 again, that's why I've only done a limited number of these is because I know how hard the workflow is. The workflow for creating these things is very challenging. Um, so kudos to you for doing that. All right, let's see here. Um, all right, I am, we are at the two hour mark, but let's see where I'm at for getting close to covering everything that you all have submitted to me. Um, let's see, I'm going to just, I'm going to go fast. We're going to go fast. We're going to get through it all. All right. That's what's going to happen now. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. So I've got. And then, and then I'm going to schedule my streams on a more regular basis so we can share all this goodness that you all are sending in. All right, so this is a couple images sent by Laz, L-O-Z. Didn't have a lot of details, so let me just share the images here. Take a look at these. So there are a couple images. He actually, he, she, uh sent three images. There was a pano that was corrupted though. So if you're seeing this then, and I don't have your email because you just put it in Dropbox. And when, when you all send me stuff in Dropbox, it doesn't send an email. It just sends your name. So I, I didn't have a way to reach out and contact you. Um, and so I don't, I, I don't have a, I don't have the third image. So if you want to resend to that one, the, the, um, panorama number six, small JPEG is the one that I did not receive. So take a look at that. But this is one of the other two images. Oh, let me get my cursor out of the way here so you can you can appreciate it. This has definitely got, yeah, definitely has a, uh, a an old film look to it. So this is the first one. And then let me pull up the second one. So also a similar kind of, similar kind of feel. Kind of, it really does kind of look like uh, film. Um, and I don't know if that's because of the noise or let me, let me take a sneak peek at the metadata. See what we got here. This was, if there's any metadata, there's no metadata. No metadata. No lens information, no camera information. It's keeping us in the dark. It's a, it's a, it's a tease. Uh, let's look at the other image. Same thing. It's a big tease to know what's, what was, how these images were shot. So it'll, it, this, this shall remain a mystery unless we are filled in. So thank you for sharing these images with us. Definitely a nice look. Uh, next up, um, I have um, a question from Keith. So Keith says, I have a Fujifilm X-T2 converted full spectrum camera by LifePixel and three filters, a super color. I think that's the 590. I sometimes forget the naming conventions. A visible light and a 720. I also have your excellent book, thank you, and profile pack, and I'm reasonably, reasonably good with editing in Lightroom. Thanks to you. Thank you again. I appreciate that. Would you recommend another couple of filters to expand my IR horizons? So, I have sort of two answers to this question. Um, the first one is, uh, I'll give you the kind of the straight answer, which is, if you're looking to, you've got a good collection of filters there um, that will cover a lot of situations. The one that you don't have that jumps out at me would be a infrared only filter. So like an 830 or an 850 nanometer filter for shooting monochrome. I think those are lovely filters. You know, you can get them from a variety of sources. 
stick with a name brand. Don't buy cheap filters. Don't buy cheap filters. Uh, get a good filter. And um, I, in particular, I have I have an STC Optics one, and I also have a B plus W, uh, which is like a zero nine two. Their naming conventions are weird, uh, but but it's an eight hundred thirty nanometer filter. It's beautiful, beautiful filter. So that would be the one thing that would sort of round out your kit. Um, but the other thing that I'll say is you don't need more filters. I mean, and I'm gonna this th I'm gonna be a little hypocritical here because of course when I got into infrared, I did what probably everybody does, which is to say I I went out and bought all the filters and I tried all the things and I spent a lot of money. Um, and then it was only later on that I'm like, you know what, I need to like pick something, stick with it, and get good at it and figure it out. Um, so don't dismiss the benefits of picking a filter and just shooting and shooting and shooting and learning and getting better at it. There's a lot of value in that. Uh, you don't, you don't need to do all the things and trial things. Now, again, I did it too. <laughs> so I'm a hypocrite. I get it. Um, there's a, there's an urge to try all the things I've bought in way too many filters. Um, but you don't need to, you know, pick a filter. You, you could buy one camera converted to one filter and just Learn to master it. Learn to master it. Maybe, maybe that's maybe I'm saying what I to my I'm talking to myself. I think is what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying what I wish I had done years ago when I started infrared. I wish I'd just picked one thing and mastered it. But these options are all all valid. They're all valid. And if you really, really, really want something to round out your kit, Keith, um, I would look at um, I would look at a an eight thirty or an eight fifty. Uh, but <clears throat> you've got a lot of great filters and a great camera. Um, and, and definitely work that out. All right. Let's see here. Um, Spectra said the benefit of sticking with one filter for a while is that you can better work out what you need. I, I agree with that. Spending a long time with just the 720 helped me realize I needed more visible color to work with. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, uh, you, 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 you get that experience by, by learning to, uh, to, to, to spending time with something and seeing how it works, how it feels. Um, I've, I've gone through various periods where I've, there was actually a period, I, I started with 590, for example, and I shot, a, I've shot a lot, probably shot more 590 than anything. And about a year or two ago, I said, you know what, I'm going to shoot a bunch of 720 because I just haven't done it. And I really needed to, um, maybe it was longer ago than that, but regardless, I was like, I needed, I need to shoot more 720. I need to get, I need to really understand this filter. And, and, and it, it's one shoot is not going to give you that understanding. You're going to need multiple shoots with different lighting conditions, different scenarios, different subjects. That's what really builds your knowledge of how a filter works with various subjects and various lighting conditions. And I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I really focused on it because it was a while where I just thought, oh, 720, I don't need that. It doesn't have the color I want or whatever. But then after I shot it, I was like, I, I grew to love the sort of desaturated look that it had. And now it's now I'm in a now I'm in sort of a desaturation phase where I like less color saturation. And I only got that because I I focused on using that filter. So definitely great. All right, I got one more set of images that I want to share. Um, this is from uh Frantisic, who's always he's the guy who's ending the lemon. He's always trying to, you know, send interesting stuff here. Um, and I love that. I appreciate it. So uh, new challenges. So let me share. Um, the images that he sent uh, with uh, this late, his latest experiment. Let me pull this up and I'll read to you uh, the details about his latest experiment. Um, Hello, Rob. I decided to submit this weird way of taking infrared images today. I used a filter sold under the designation GRB3, which blocks most light after the 850 mark. So it's actually blocked. If I'm reading this right, it's blocking above 850. I stacked it with a yellow filter, which I think gave some pretty interesting results. The images don't even need to be color swapped. You can also use this filter with an orange filter, or you can use it just by itself for images that look mostly normal. Very fun to experiment with it. Thanks for reading and sharing. So <clears throat> if I'm reading this correctly, then you've got a filter that... Um, what you're doing by kind of stacking these filters is you're you're not exactly creating a dual band pass, but you're kind of like maybe dampening portions of the of the spectrum that you're seeing. Um, 
I've seen a lot of uh, 470 nanometer filters that kind of have this purplish look, and I could see we're dampening out some of the colors. And of course, you've got like a filter like an IR Chrome does that. It cuts out uh, a lot of the colors that you would normally see and only captures blue and infrared. Uh, 470 captures a lot of purple in these colors. Maybe dampening some of these colors uh, is really interesting. I think what it, what it goes to show is that, uh, you know, obviously... I have done a lot. I've shown a lot of techniques about editing infrared, but there's a lot of techniques you can get by using different filter combinations. I've, in fact, I've got some filters that I've purchased that I'm trying to get uh, sh to shoot with, uh, diff different combinations of stacks of filters to produce different results. You know, there's this, it feels like there's this, um, for, for a long time, there's been this chase of people chasing um Aerochrome and trying to reproduce Aerochrome in various ways, whether it's the IR Chrome filter or stacking various filters. Um, so there's that chase, and that's that's okay. I mean, if you want to chase that, but I love this experimentation of trying different uh, filter stacks and seeing how they look and seeing what the result is. This is this was actually a, a raw that I was playing with, and I was not able to reduce the 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 beautiful purple colors uh, that Frantisek was able to. Uh, produce. I'm trying to remember what I did here. I just did like a, a temperature shift and played around with it a bit. Uh, his version got like, oh, I think it was this, I think it was the following image is his edit with, you know, much more vibrant purples. Um, <clears throat> so love, I love the experimentation um, and the look that you've got here. This one's a little dark, might be kind of hard to see what's happening. Looks like it yeah, same filter though. Um, you can, you can kind of see some of this coloration going on. But I think that first one uh, really shows off the potential of something like this. So I love uh, when, when you share these experiments so we can all see what's available out there and, and pick up weird filters from, uh, you know, filter. I used to go to these, uh, these used uh, camera sales in the Bay Area. I love doing that to, to see all the old equipment people would bring out and old lenses and old filters and stuff. And it's like tables and tables of filters. Um, and you know, if you can get them affordably enough, you can do all kinds of experiments with them. So this is awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, Frantisek for sharing these. I appreciate, uh, as, as usual, your, um, enthusiasm for trying new things and sharing with us. It's fantastic. All right. So that, uh, wraps up, uh, all, all of the stream we had for today. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for, for thank you for stopping by. Uh, thank you, especially if you uh, were in a time zone that made stopping by inconvenient. Thank you even more. Um, thank you for hanging around. I appreciate everybody who sent in images uh, and questions for the live streams. That's what really kind of makes this possible. The demand, I didn't quite, when I first started doing these seriously about six months ago, I didn't know what kind of demand that I've seen. And so... It was hard to know how to schedule these, but now that I've seen the the interest level and the amount of material that people send me, I think I'm going to probably pick up like a monthly schedule and start scheduling these once a month, maybe maybe alternating between a, a weekday and a weekend so we can hit different time zones. Uh, but um, I, I really appreciate everybody sending this stuff in. I, I continue to learn from what you're sending me, and that's why I do this is because... Uh, I, uh, this, this whole process for me is about learning how I learn in photography and then how I share what I've learned and you all, uh, feeding me interesting images and techniques and trying things. It forces me to learn more and I love it because that's what I'm here for. So thank you so much for stopping by or thank you so much for watching the recording. And I look forward to uh, seeing you in the next one and looking at your images and answering your questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy shooting. Bye.